says the new problems are just pesky little things and should be cleared up in no time at all. Schick also says a recent problem with the spacecraft's internal electrical generating system has now been corrected, and the Columbia is still set to begin its maiden voyage around 6.50 a.m. on Friday. Of course, the space shuttle is a big deal to the future of the entire U.S. space program. And in tonight's installment of our Action News Extra, Countdown to Blast Off, I found out that the shuttle carries an appropriately very large price tag. Would you pay $9 billion for a truck? Well, don't look now, but you just did with your tax dollars. NASA people most often describe the shuttle as a space truck. The cargo bay, or payload area, is 60 feet long, 15 feet in diameter, and can carry up to 65,000 pounds into orbit. We intend to provide the capability to, uh, to uh, take the payload from the Earth up to a low Earth orbit, maybe uh, two, 300 miles high, and uh, then release it, and uh, it's up to him to get where he wants to go from there. This is the manipulator arm that's so essential to placing payloads in space. And as mocked up in Houston, Texas, uh, this is sort of the way it would work. An operator standing here would manipulate that arm, monitoring on television and visually to take whatever payload they had aboard from inside and put it outside. The shuttle will be used for things like taking communication satellites into space, then kicking them into a higher stationary orbit. It's a whole lot cheaper than launching those satellites from the ground with an old-fashioned rocket that is not reusable. The shuttle also has some military capabilities, but you don't hear very much about that. In case somebody launches a satellite that we don't want up there, we could conceivably go up and retrieve it with this kind of a system. Does that make any sense at all? Is that a possibility? It's, it's a possibility. Now, as you well know, uh, the uh, NASA and the Air Force are both in this project together. Outside of the Titan uh, 3C that they use today, uh, this is their only uh, means of getting something up in orbit. So, uh, yes, the, probably uh, 30 to 40 percent of the payloads that we launch will be uh, for DOD. DOD, of course, stands for Department of Defense. Privately, some NASA people will tell you that if it weren't for the Defense Department, the government would have been a lot less anxious to keep funding the much-delayed shuttle system. Everything about the project is big, especially the price tag. And tomorrow night, we'll take a close look at some of the incredible facts and figures of the space shuttle. Jim O'Brien, Channel 6 Action News. Delays in preparing the space shuttle for launching this week. All relatively small problems, but they've added to the workload. The test director said workmen are taking a little longer to make sure everything is right and that they should be able to meet the Friday morning launch time. Worked through their rest period today, making repairs to get the Space Shuttle Columbia back on schedule for a dawn liftoff Friday. A spokesman said, at this time, there's no trouble meeting that date. But Air Force weathermen said gusty winds along Florida's east coast are raising concern that weather could delay that launch. Crews working on the Space Shuttle concentrated on clearing up some minor problems. NASA officials say they are still aiming for Friday launch with a few reservations. We'll have the full story. We go back to Cape Canaveral and Max Robinson. Max? Frank, at the launch pad, the countdown has entered a crucial phase. The issue is time. By late this afternoon, work on the shuttle was more than a dozen hours behind schedule. 30 hours of pad time had been built in, but nearly half of that has been eaten up. During the countdown, these shots from black and white NASA cameras are the only close-up views we have of what is going on at the shuttle. NASA officials maintain the problems that are causing the delays are minor. Nevertheless, such problems plus weather could delay the launch. If you were a betting man, what day would you pick for launch day? <laughs> well, I have bet on April 15th on this side of it. So uh, I'm still working on the 10th. I'm not going to be surprised to the 11th or the 12th, but uh, by the 15th for sure. The problems which now raise questions about whether or not the shuttle will actually lift off this Friday are far from new. For science editor Jules Bergman reports tonight in part one of his special assignment series, the shuttle had been troubled by numerous problems long before it ever arrived here at the launch site. December 29th, 1980, four days after Christmas, the Space Shuttle Columbia is finally on its way to Pad 39A, the future launch site of man's first reusable spacecraft. The shuttle, as large as a DC-9, is attached to its external tank and the solid rocket boosters, which will propel it into its first orbital flight three days from now. The giant crawler used to transport the shuttle moves at one mile per hour. On its platform, a technological marvel, a piece of engineering unlike, many say, any other ever designed by man. 
But the road to this point in 1980 was marred by an unequaled record of technical failures and launch delays. They quickly add up to the longest delays in the history of manned spaceflight. Why so far behind schedule? One reason, the schedule itself left no room for failure. We had a success-oriented schedule, and uh, as happens on the first vehicle, everything doesn't go perfectly. So but if you schedule seven days a week, there's no way you're going to make it. And uh, you, there's just too many things that come up in this work that take that little extra time. The shuttle's thermal protection system turned out to be one of those things that took a lot of extra time. The silica heat tiles dissipate the 3,000 degree heat of re-entry. They work beautifully. Just one trouble, they wouldn't stay attached to the shuttle. Unlike previous heat shields, such as on Apollo, which got rid of the heat by charring or ablating as the spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and were not reusable, the shuttle's heat tiles remain intact and are designed to be reused 50 times. There are 32,000 heat tiles on the shuttle, and if they fail in certain critical areas, the vehicle will burn up upon re-entry. The Columbia was scheduled to be in this processing hangar four months after its arrival at Cape Canaveral in March 1979. Instead, it remained in the hangar until last November, a delay of nearly a year and a half. In those 20 months, hundreds of Rockwell technicians had to replace 80% of the heat tiles, 25,000 in all, then test them to meet new and tougher requirements. Replacing them was not easy. Their computer cut so fragile that they dent when touched and had to be replaced one by one. They're supposed to last 50 missions, but stronger tiles are already being developed for later flights. Five, four, we have a goal for main engine start. We have main engine start. All three engines are up and running. The other major source of trouble, and also critical to the shuttle's reusability, are three main liquid fuel rocket engines. They are the most powerful and complex of their kind ever built, operating at more than three times the pressure of any past liquid rocket. More importantly, they had to be designed small enough to be protected by the shuttle itself during re-entry and tough enough to be reused 55 times. But the engines have never flown in space, and time after time, test failures sent the engineers back to the drawing board. For example, in 1978 alone, there were five major failures during testing. All the test failures in engines, heat tiles, and other vital components by NASA's own admission virtually doubled the five and a half billion dollar cost of the shuttle. The cost estimates now vary from nine to twelve billion dollars. Was it worth it? There's no question in my mind that the shuttle if it works as we expect it will, will greatly enhance our ability to operate in space and therefore will prove very much to be worthwhile. It's the first major step to moving our civilization and the facilities of that civilization into space. Tomorrow, we'll look at the role politics has played in this move into space and strangely enough how budget cutting has actually driven the cost of the shuttle up and helped delay its first flight three years. Jules Bergman, ABC News, at the Kennedy Space Center. The space shuttle's two astronauts, John Young and Robert Crippen, spent their last two days in Houston in quarantine. They finished up almost three years of training with a test flight to keep their reflexes sharp. Tomorrow, they arrive here at the Cape. The launch is still set for early Friday, weather and technology permitting, and we'll bring it to you live. Extended hold in the space shuttle countdown. NASA expects the launch to proceed on schedule early Friday. When Columbia finally is launched, along with, its, along with it will go special research equipment that hopefully will expand man's knowledge of space. Kevin Saunders has this report from the Kennedy Space Center. This is the news briefing room here at the Kennedy Space Center. We have a continuous monitoring of the procedures in the firing room and uh, occasional updates on the countdown. And between times, the journalists here are able to enjoy a kind of uh, teach-in or seminar on the space shuttle and what it's going to do. Today we talked about this. This is the space telescope, or at least a model of the space telescope. The actual space telescope is about the size of a Greyhound bus and will occupy the entire cargo bay of the shuttle. Dr. David Morrison is the assistant administrator for space sciences at NASA. The main power of this space telescope is its ability to see fainter and therefore farther into space. 
Uh, so it will reveal to us something like a hundred times more of space than we can see.